Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here in historic um, Perugia and uh, grateful to have been invited to this conference. Um, let me see. Yeah, the subject of my talk uh, will be one of the Sunday conferences. You probably all know of uh, the, some of the earlier ones. The 1911, which was the first of the Sunday conferences. The 1927, famous conference with the interpretation of quantum mechanics and so on. But the 1958 conference is interesting because it uh, was the first conference ever which dealt with uh, cosmology. And that is, will be the subject of my brief talk. Now, uh, this conference was originally scheduled to take place in 1957, uh, and the reason why it was postponed to 1958 was that we had this uh, great uh, world fair in Brussels at that time with the uh, famous icon, the Atomicum, which uh, many of you will know. And, uh, and uh, uh, the subject was, as I said, cosmology, the science of the universe, the structure of the universe, which at that time was highly unusual. And it seems that the idea to come up with that subject, rather with a more conventional subject, was due to Lawrence Black, who definitely was not a cosmologist, but who had an interest in it. And uh, he says in a letter from the early 1957 to a Danish serious question, uh, I think this is a great idea because then we can convene cosmologists, physicists, and astronomers. Wouldn't that be a good idea? And of course, we always thought that it would be a good idea. Uh, and so, uh, uh, these uh, some uh, 20, 30 uh, scientists convened uh, based on that subject. However, because, before I go into the content, what happened at the conference. I need to say a few words about the status of cosmology at the time, which was entirely different from what it is today. Uh, first of all, cosmology had a very low reputation. There were seriously many scientists who doubted if cosmology could be a science and did and that uh, in its present state, it was not. It didn't simply didn't live up to the criteria of being a science. And we have numerous expressions of it, uh, such as, as these ones, all from the 1950s. Uh, Oscar Klein, for instance, the great Swedish series who participated in the conference, he says that it's a field where personal taste would greatly influence the choice of basic hypothesis. And Martin Bryan, the British radio astronomer and later Nobel laureate, whose work did a lot to make cosmology a science, he says in an earlier article, cosmologists have always lived in the happy state of being able to postulate theory which has no chance of being disproved. Uh, I should also mention, perhaps, if you have come across this last quotation by Landau, and it is, one can find it in many publications. In all likelihood, it is epicritical. I mean, he, it has never been documented that he said that, but it's a good quote. Um, the uh, local quotation of cosmology at the time is also illustrated that by, by uh, the fact that very few scientific papers were written on that subject. Uh, it was a very small field, and I will illustrate that uh, with a graph which is not uh, based on my own uh, data, but I have taken it from an earlier article. This is a number of uh, scientific articles on cosmology uh, taken from the uh, uh, the, the leading uh, radio journal at the time, Physics Abstracts. And this is the absolute numbers. As first of all, you can see that 
throughout the entire period, very, very few articles were written. Uh, during the war, the number of articles on cosmology was practically zero. And then uh, we see that in the 19, or we see apparently that in the 1960s, the number rose in an exponential like uh, healthy, uh, progressive manner. Uh, and that agrees with our intuition that this should happen because something very important took place in the 1960s, which is after all the decade in which uh, the cosmic microwave background was discovered, the quasars were discovered, and, uh, and, and a lot of other things. So we have the new cosmology at that time. But as you also probably know from many other uh, similar um, bibliographic studies, these numbers uh, can, can lie. Uh, the progress we see here is actually deceptive because if we take the very same numbers, uh, not in absolute numbers, but as a fraction of the total numbers in physics, we get an entirely different view. And the progress in the 1960s simply disappears. The, uh, the lack of interest uh, of, uh, in cosmology at the time is also illustrated by the fact that there were no departments, university departments, in which cosmology was taught. Uh, there were very few courses. And uh, if students of physics met cosmology at, at all, it was uh, in courses on general relativity, of which there were very few as well. And there were very few textbooks as well. Uh, maybe, well, depending on how one uh, defined a textbook, I would say that there were perhaps four or five textbooks. Uh, briefly mention them. Um, the American physicist uh, Richard Tolman wrote in 1934 a very important work on relativity, thermodynamics, and cosmology. Uh, this work was used still at the time, but it was obviously it was dated, going back to 1934. Uh, then there was an excellent, uh, very precise and updated work by the German uh, astronomer Otto Heckmann, Theorem der Cosmologie, which was known to a few specialists, but it was published in 1942 in the midst of the, of the war. It was published only in German, so it was known by very few people uh, in spite of its great uh, intellectual qualities. Though there's no doubt that the best uh, book or kind of textbook in the period was Hermann Wander's work with simply called Cosmology, which was published in 1952 in its first edition and came out in the second edition in 1956. That book although it was widely used, was also, um, I think one can say that it was somewhat biased uh, towards the steady state theory of which Bardet was a leading advocate. So, uh, uh, much of the, um, many of the discussions uh, at the 1958 survey conference uh, Dealt directly or indirectly uh, with the controversy between the two leading views of the universe. And I have to say a little about this because uh, I guess that nowadays the steady state theory of the universe is not uh, widely known. And if it is known, it's definitely known to be wrong. Um, In 1948, uh, three British physicists, two of them of Austrian descent, uh, Fred Hoyle, uh, Bondi, and Tommy Gold, published two papers in which they uh, led the foundation of what became known as the state of state theory of the universe. Uh, they were dissatisfied with uh, the, um, the common view of the universe, which was based on uh, Einstein's cosmological field equations, and uh, 
uh, these are some of the uh, motivations, for some of the reasons why they came up with this uh, completely different view of the universe, where the universe has always existed, there's no beginning of the universe, there's no end of it, and the universe at a very large scale has always looked the same, and will always look the same, the so-called perfect cosmological principle. I will only mention that uh, some of these motivations evidently was of a, a philosophical or methodological nature. Uh, uh, the only, because of lack of time, I will only uh, say a little about the so-called time scale problem, which was a problem which has haunted cosmology since its very beginning, uh, at about 1930, and in a certain sense is still here today. Uh, this is the uh, elementary problem that the universe cannot possibly be younger than any of its constituents. I mean, from a logical point of view, simply that is impossible. Nonetheless, uh, the accepted age of the universe as given by the so-called Hubble time, with the inverse of the Hubble constant, uh, was at about 1950, known, or thought to be known, to be 1.8 million billion years. And uh, the older stars were much, much older. In 1952, Radha Bader, the German-American astronomer, had revised the Hubble's original data, then came up with a, a bigger number, namely the, uh, that, that the Hubble time was uh, about three or four billion years. And by 1958, uh, the observed Hubble constant or Hubble time had changed again, but, and the, the people uh, more or less believed that the universe um, had existed for perhaps 8 billion years. But the problem was still there, because the older stars and the older galaxies um, possibly were uh, 12 billion years at least. Um, yes. And then, uh, from a more methodological point of view, uh, the steady state theorist pointed out that relativistic theory, meaning the evolution theory is based on uh, the cosmological field equations, is not really a theory. It, 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 because it, it uh, includes a, a large number of models. Some of these models, typical models, in the so-called case like the Sigma model, uh, but there are other models, uh, so it's very hard and perhaps impossible to falsify the relativistic evolution theory because it does not lead to precise predictions. And in that respect, the steady state theory definitely was better. It was a, a marvelous theory from the point of view of prediction and falsification. <coughs> and here we have some of the uh, uh, main results uh, from that theory. Uh, according to the steady state theory, uh, not only does, this, does the universe expand, but it expands exponentially, the, the space is flat, and the so called deceleration parameter, which is a measure of the slowing down of the expansion, was and had to be uh, minus one. And this, this uh, quantity is measuring. Uh, again, it gave a definite uh, um, a value for the uh, matter density. And uh, of course, with regard to elements, the, the, the uh, formation of chemical elements, uh, all these elements had to, had to uh, take part in present objects, in stars and galaxies and nobody and what have you because there was no big thing. Um, so, uh, let me go back to uh, 1958 and to the people convening in Brussels. To the gentlemen meeting in Brussels. I don't know really if they were gentlemen, but they definitely were men, and only men. Keeping to a tradition, more or less. And here we have them. Um, I will not go, I'm not going to mention, of course, all the names. Some of them are very well known, others are not. Uh, but in the, 
in the middle of the front row, we had work on Cowley. And it's worth to point out that uh, Cowley, he, well, he wasn't a cosmology, but he was a great specialist, of course, in relativity theory. And uh, this was one of his very last meetings uh, in December of something, of, I think, 58, uh, he died. Uh, next to, uh, next to, uh, uh, yeah, next to uh, Paul we have Lawrence Black, and to his right we have uh, uh, Oppenheimer, who was uh, chair of this uh, session. And uh, well, I mentioned a few of the others. Uh, in the back row to the uh, left we have Oscar Klein, who was not only a, a great quantum theorist, but also at that time had begun uh, a serious work in, in general relativity theory and uh, cosmology. <coughs> there are three or oh, four people, well, well, to be exact, four of these people were proponents of the state state theory. That was Fred Hoyle. I don't have a pointer, so I can't show you. But we have in the back room, uh, we have. Uh, Fred Hoyle is number three from the left. Then we have uh, Henry Bundy, we have Tommy Gold, and the uh, gentleman uh, in the front row to the left is the Irish British uh, relativist and cosmologist um, William McRae. So four of these uh, were uh, advocates of the state state theory. And it is remarkable that um, the only person who was in favor of an explosion theory of the universe, a kind of Big Bang theory, uh, was George Lemaitre. I'll come to him in a, in a minute. One person who was definitely missing, and it's, it's very remarkable that he was not invited to this meeting, was the scientist who's more than anyone else uh, should be known as the father of the Big Bang. Well, you may call Lemaitre the grandfather of the Big Bang, which is okay, I think, but the, the father, if paternity has to be pointed out, was definitely, um, was, was, was uh, definitely George Gamow, um, and he was not invited. And we know from Gamow's correspondence that he wanted to be invited. He was in Europe at the time, and he wrote, to, to Pauli, please, will you not, please in, in, in invite me. I will be happy to be there, but he was not invited. And we know uh, from the letter from Pauli to one of his colleagues, rightly, he says in that letter that, <coughs> well, uh, Pauli, uh, Pauli uh, nonsense, uh, Gamma will not be there uh, because of some health troubles of which I, about which I prefer not to write. These so-called health problems were known in the small community. Uh, it was a drinking problem. Gamma was at the time uh, more or less an alcoholic. He was known to bring a bottle of whiskey with him, sometimes to his lectures, and uh, there were all kind of em embarrassing scenes. He was hospitalized for it, and uh, apparently that was the reasons for not inviting him. Gamma didn't buy that explanation. He saw that uh, that the uh, people in Brussels were prejudiced in favor of the, uh, of the state state theory and that they didn't want uh, to hear about this theory. But it is remarkable that in the proceedings of that um, conference, that is the proceedings volume which came out the same year, and the word ammo is not to be found. There's simply is simply not mentioned. Uh, of course, there's no mention of the Big Bang. The name Big Bang was not well known at the time. It was coined by 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 um, by Hoyle, uh, but it was not widely used, and none of them used that term. Uh, also remarkable is it that the cosmic microwave background was not mentioned at all. So let me mention very briefly that in uh, 1948, two of Gamow's uh, collaborators, Nate, uh, 
Robert Herman and uh, Rev Elford had predicted from Gamow's explosion theory that there should be a microwave background. That is 1948. It was repeated by Gamow in several articles, and then it was forgotten. Very strange uh, thing it was not mentioned at all. Uh, but as I said, um, Social Nature uh, was there. He was Belgium, of course, and uh, uh, he was the first one in 1931 to propose what later became known as the uh, Big Bang Theory, what, what, uh, what the major called uh, the theory of the primeval atom. This, uh, this model of, of, of the major included the so-called cosmological constant. You may know that way back in 1917, when Einstein came up with his static model, he had introduced the so-called cosmological constant, a general labor of lambda. Uh, and uh, Einstein very soon came to dislike it for various reasons. So uh, by 1950, almost all cosmologists believed that the cosmological constant was zero, that it was non non-existing but uh, not according to uh, Le Maitre, who kept to a, to a positive cosmological constant, and if you do that, then you can have a, 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 an explosion universe of very, very uh, large age. Um, yes. Now, what were the problems discussed at that uh, conference? People, of course, discussed uh, how to test these two antagonistic models, uh, kind of models. One was the extended state model, of course, and it, as, I, as I indicated, it led to various precise uh, predictions, and the other was a class of relativistic evolution models, not necessarily Big Bang models, but evolution models. And, uh, here we have some of the tests, uh, and of course I'm not going through all of them, don't have time for it, so I only mention, uh, yeah, I already mentioned the time scale uh, problem. Uh, another one which in which the two kinds of models differ radically was with regard to nuclear synthesis, I mean how the chemical elements were formed. Uh, because, as I said, with the steady state theory, there was no Big Bang, and obviously then all kind of nuclear uh, processes had to take part in the interior of stars and that kind of things. And uh, Fred Hoyle was a great specialist uh, in uh, nuclear physicist, uh, in, 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 in nuclear, uh, in still nuclear reactions. He was trained as a, as a nuclear physicist. And, um, just a the year before 1948, uh, Hoyle and his three collaborators, uh, Burbage and Burbage, Margaret Burbage and, uh, uh, well, the other Burbage and, uh, and, and the Fowler, had written a um, very, very important paper. Actually, it, it filled out uh, the entire radio model physics. It was a paper of more than 100 pages. One of the great papers in, in the 20th century uh, nuclear phys uh, physics in which they uh, came up with a detailed, uh, detailed uh, reactions for the formation of uh, heavy elements. Uh, this, this theory is known as the B2FH theory, Burbage, 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 uh, Farrell and, and Horner, and as uh, he pointed out, uh, in Brussels, uh, it agreed very well with the steady state theory. On the other hand, uh, I also know that it, does, it did not disagree with the, uh, with the Big Bang theory because the Big Bang theory had the advantage that it had two kinds of nuclear ovens. It had the stars and the galaxies and the nova, but then it also had the Big Bang, which was evidently was absent in the other theory. And that uh, was no clue. That uh, was of importance with regards to the light elements. Uh, way back 
in the uh, at, at line to 50, Gamow and his collaborators had calculated from Big Bang assumptions that uh, the amount of helium in the universe and with an origin in, in, in the Big Bang was probably of the order of 20 to 30 percent by weight of mass. And uh, that turned out in the 1960s to be one of the arguments for the, the Big Bang theory. But it was not an argument at the time. And the reason was simply that there were no observations of any quality uh, which showed the number, the, the percentage of, of helium in the universe. So uh, this uh, argument was ineffective. But there were, a, um, yeah, I, I will limit myself just to mention uh, two, and I'll do it briefly, two other of the potential tests. I mean, tests which people discuss and could in principle uh, discriminate between them. Radio astronomy was at the time a very new science. Uh, it, it, uh, for various reasons, it was developed in England and not in uh, the United States. And uh, Martin Weil and, uh, and, and, and other people uh, developed radio astronomy also to cover cosmological aspects. Uh, and uh, uh, at the at the uh, at the meeting in it was it was discussed by um, um, it was discussed by uh, Bernard Lovell, the head of the John Bank Observatory. He presented the the, uh, the the picture to the right side. The picture to the left side is uh, is based on an article by Marshall Ryan. The idea is that. Uh, that this kind of graph should, I mean, if the universe is, is, is uh, in the same state, then all, all the observational points should be uh, in the lower part. Uh, and and uh, so Ryle and Lovell and others argued that the present observations disagree with the steady state theory. Uh, however, other data were different. There was a lot of confusion with regards to the reliability of these data. So, um, so at the time it was not yet possible to say that radio astronomy disagrees with uh, state state theory. And the same goes with another classical test going back to Hubble, uh, the magnitude redshift uh, test, which was cultivated by um, Alan Sandage, who was Hubble's... If you want, you can get Okay, yes, but uh, too late, thank you. Um, well, uh, Alan Sandage was Hubble's uh, successor, and uh, he was uh, in command of the, the largest optical telescope uh, at, at the time. And uh, by making these kind of observations in the optical area, uh, one could find the so-called deceleration constant, and, uh, and we see that in 1956 he concluded that it was about uh, 2.5, plus 2.5, with a considerable uncertainty. It was very, very different from the minus one completely by the state of state theory, and, uh, uh, and uh, Sandage concludes, quote, that this state of state theory does not fit the real world. He was right, of course, but he couldn't have known it at the time. The, the, uh, the data were not good enough. So let me end by uh, saying that, uh, that this meeting in, 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 um, in Brussels was important because it gave for the first time, um, it, it, um, it, 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 um, uh, that, that people discussed the, the problems of, 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 of of cosmology, but without coming to any final conclusion. Uh, they, they, um, the, the situation in 1958 was just as undecided, just as puzzling that it had been uh, a few years earlier. So it took a few more years 
1965, that is the true transition period of cosmology. That was a period in which the, the helium amount was determined that the uh, that the microwave background was observed and understood to be a remnant of the Big Bang, and quasars were observed, and so on. So by 1966, I would say, uh, the overwhelming majority of astronomers and physicists adopted the Big Bang theory, and very few stuck to the steady state theory. Fred Hoyle, of course, stuck to that theory throughout his life. He died in 1905, I think. Um, and that is what I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Discussion, six, seven minutes. So I open the floor to questions and comments from the audience. On this, so I give the microphone. I don't know if it's really necessary. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I was just wondering if you can expand a little bit about the uh, helium problem. Uh, how the, uh, I, I did not follow very well when this uh, became uh, an evidence and uh, how uh, then this was o overcome uh, later. Uh, as far as, as the helium problem is concerned, I think that the first reliable data uh, are from 1962 or something. An American astronomer, Osterbrock, if I re recall uh, correctly, uh, who concluded that there was much, much more helium in the universe than could be explained from, from a, a stellar nuclear reaction and things like that. And then uh, in 1965, it was calculated on the basis of the Big Bang Theory uh, by Jim Peebles and others who came up with about 30% or so, and, and, and not only helium, but also uh, the heavy uh, hydrogen deuterium. Um, so, and, and I know that Jim Peebles have, who's fortunately still alive, and he has gone back in the literature, and he has uh, examined the original uh, calculations of Gamma and his collaborators, and uh, uh, he concludes that they were uh, rather fortunate to get the right order of magnitude of, of helium. But if they had done their calculations correctly, they would have gone another and not so good uh, amount of helium. Um, yeah. Thanks. And then I have a question. <laughs> Are there other questions? Uh, once I had one, uh, so thanks a lot, you gave a wonderful overview of what was the status of cosmology in the 1950s to, um, uh, at the time of the 1958 Survey Conference. Uh, so the question is, if the status of cosmology was so low, so many people thought that it was uh, still uh, science in its infancy, uh, where philosophical consideration played a lot of role. Why did the Sobek Conference was organized on cosmology, given the fact that the Sobek Conference were known to be a, a choosing uh, fields which were on the front, on the frontier, right? I mean, this was how the Sobek Conference and the organized the sky itself. At least this was certainly true in before World War II. So after World War II, there was certainly a different situation. Uh, and as you know, there are some people who describe, me, describe a certain sort of renaissance or general relativity in the 1950s, which include this kind of attempt to build a community through conferences. So I'm wondering why did they choose the cosmology as an important topic? And did they didn't even invite one of the two contents 
in the possible controversy at the time. I, it, it is a little uh, surprising, and it's also surprising that the uh, that the proposal apparently originally came from Lawrence Black, who is known for something very different. But Black was British, and the Steady State theory was very much a British theory. It was popular almost only in Britain, and there's no doubt that Black must have known about it, but it was highly controversial uh, in that country. Uh, but to know uh, why, uh, why Black's proposal was accepted uh, I have to go to the uh, survey archives, and I have done, not done that yet. But uh, it should also be mentioned that although uh, this uh, was one of the first uh, conference on cosmologies at, at all, similar uh, cosmology had also been discussed earlier, but typically in relation to relativity theory. Uh, for instance, as you know better than anyone else, in 1955 there was the Jubilee Conference uh, on Einstein's Relativity Theory in Bern, 1955, a very important conference, and several of the speakers in, in these relativity conferences spoke about cosmology. Um, but of course not steady state theory. Uh, I think in 1955, the Relativity Conference, oil was there too, uh, but I can't remember if he actually spoke on the state case theory. Uh, Bondi was in the Berne conference. He, yeah. He was there, yes. Yeah. So you, you just introduced the state state in the, um, and now I wanted to ask, well, are there any other questions? So that was yet another one. Are there other questions on the. Uh, so, in the, in the Solvay Conference in 1958, there was also uh, an interesting discussion between Wheeler and Oppenheimer on the contraction, of gravitational contraction of stars. How was this related to the cosmological? Because they discussed that Wheeler was very skeptical of the Oppenheimer Snyder contraction hypothesis based on gravitational uh, theory of general relative perception. So, about whether uh, but, uh, over a certain mass, a uh, star would go into collapse, gravitational collapse. And, but how was it today to the general topic of the conference? Uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, Wheeler gave a talk, a very, very long talk, uh, which, uh, uh, and what he did primarily, uh, if I recall it, uh, with the problems in general relativity and with collapsing stars and things like that. I don't think he, in the discussion session, he says, uh, and Oppenheimer says too, that they, they did not believe in the state state theory. Um, but Wheeler was not, I, I, I don't think he was very much occupied with cosmology as such. And, and the same goes for Oppenheimer. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, to know uh, if, if you have some uh, hypothesis on, on why uh, uh, the, the, the idea of cosmic, cosmic background radiation was forgotten after the article you quoted of 1948. Uh, how, how, and, and why this, if I well understand, was not at all discussed in the Soviet yeah. conference. And yeah, and that problem has been discussed endlessly by, by, by very uh, people and there's, I don't think there's, there's any very good answer to it but one of the answers is that, that uh, although they came up with this hypothesis that there must be this background uh, people thought that it was it couldn't be measured uh, and, but it is remarkable that, uh, that the, the, the Gamow's uh, Big Bang Theory was dead for a period, but not, I mean, literally dead. From 1953 to 1964, there was published one paper on Big Bang Theory. So over a 10 years uh, period, it was dead, and that may have been another reason for why uh, not inviting uh, Gamma. Uh, I mean, why should we discuss a theory which nobody cares about? 
Yes. Thanks a lot. I think there are no other questions. We can uh, thank again the head of the